Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At this time, all participants are in the listen-only mode. For those connected by telephone requiring operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. Web participants requiring support should use the chat feature on your screen. I would like to now turn the meeting over to your moderator today, Tanya McDonald, Director at CFHI. Please go ahead. Thank you and uh, welcome to today's webinar. My name is Tanya McDonald. I'm Director of Programs at uh, CFHI and I'm really happy that all of you could join us today as we talk about uh, policy and quality of life in long-term care. So before I start, I just want to begin by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people since the beginning. In particular, I acknowledge that I am coming today from Ottawa, the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and the people, and we recognize and deeply appreciate their historic connection to this place and the sacrifices of those who have gone before. We are also pleased to offer this webinar in both official languages. If you would like to view today's slides in French, please let us know using the chat box on the screen. We invite you to use either official language when entering your questions, comments in uh, the chat box throughout today's session. So as you can see, the title of our webinar today is Quality of Life, What's Policy? So Seniors Adding Life to Years, or SALTI, is a Canadian Institute of Health research-funded study on quality of life and long-term care. The research project explores clinical, social, and policy approaches that support and enhance quality of care for residents living their last years in Canadian long-term care across four Canadian jurisdictions, Nova Scotia, Ontario, Alberta, and British Columbia. SALTI researchers will share insights of how long-term care policy supports or inhibits quality of life for residents, their families, and staff. The webinar will explore the participants, the policies needed to protect quality of life for residents, and ask how one can put a regulation on respect. In addition, researchers will discuss how the COVID-19 pandemic has added to the bureaucracy of the long-term care policy landscape and how, much, how such a regulated complex system responds when stressed in this way. So today we have three speakers uh, who will be presenting the research uh, findings. So Dr. Janice Keefe is Professor and Chair, Department of Family Studies and Gerontology. Lena Isabel Jodry, Chair in Gerontology and Director, Nova Scotia Center on Aging at Mount St. Vincent University. Dr. Keefe is the Scientific Director of Seniors Adding Life to Years and National Research Team to Improve the Quality of Life Residents in Long-Term Care in Canada and is a senior member of Translating Research to Elder Care, also known as TREC. In 2018, Dr. Keefe chaired the Ministerial Expert Panel on Long-Term Care for Nova Scotia. We also have Dr. Deanne Taylor. She is the Scientific Director of the Rural Coordination Center of BC, Corporate Director of Research, Interior Health, and Adjunct Professor at UBCO in the Faculty of Health and Social Development. She leads, cultivates, and facilitates a range of research and knowledge translation activities with the aim of enhancing the use of evidence into practice and enabling broad engagement in research. Dr. Taylor is a lead investigator of Seniors Adding Life to Years. And we also have Heather Cook. She is a Senior Health Executive with experience in long-term care, home and community care, and acute care in British Columbia. Executive roles have included Chief Nursing Officer and Executive Director in Health Authorities in BC. She is co-investigator, key knowledge user, and decision maker in partnership with leading researchers in seniors' issues, including being lead knowledge user of seniors adding life to years. Currently, Ms. Cook works in the Office of the Seniors Advocate Provincial Go Government of BC as the Director of Systemic Reviews and Research. I will now pass to Mayan Marchand, who will present today's outline for the session. Hi everyone, thank you Tanya. Uh, so during today's webinars, uh, our speakers will offer an overview of the SALTI project as well as more information on their research team. Uh, and then we'll take a deeper dive into the findings of their policy analysis in long-term care homes across uh, four jurisdictions. And that'll also touch on the COVID-19 experience regarding uh, visitor restrictions and workforce implications. And finally, the speakers will discuss the future of long-term care policy in Canada regarding uh, different models of care and regulations. So just before I pass it off to our first speaker, I'll invite all of you to type in any questions or comments that you might have along the way uh, in our chat box, and we'll take them up during our Q&A period. And for now, I'll hand it over to our first presenter, uh, Dr. Keith. Thank you so much, and a special thank you to CFHI for helping to host and support our research through this platform. We really appreciate the opportunity to get some of the messages that we've been learning about through our work out to the public. 
So I'm the scientific director, and uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the the project itself. Uh, we are a, a, a significant team across the country, um, and uh, as as a scientific lead, I'm very pleased to have a fabulous lineup of uh, academics, of knowledge users, of citizens in our advisory group, as well as uh, trainees and uh, clinicians that participate with us. We're very fortunate to have funding from, as a national team from the Canadian Institute of Health Research with supplementary, uh, supplementary funding from the Michael Smith Foundation in BC, Research Nova Scotia, and the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. Do you see some pictures of our team that includes residents, people living with dementia, um, family caregivers, frontline workers, and our advisory board, as well as a number of knowledge users. We, as a goal, are wanting to add quality of life to late life, particularly for residents living in long-term care. So for us, it's insufficient just to add um, life uh, to uh, or years to our lives. We need to think about adding happiness, joy, life two years, hence the name SALTI. And we look at that from the point of emission until even post-death in terms of uh, bereavement. We have this uh, large team, as you can see, a number of trainees, collaborators, knowledge users all across Canada. We're divided into four different work packages or projects, one looking at uh, mapping care relationships um, at York and Ottawa and St. Evex University monitoring care practice in terms of the clinical aspects of end-of-life care and removing some of the burdensome um, symptoms of care at the end of life, evaluating a palliative approach to care that's led in um, the University of Victoria, and then the one that we're going to talk to you about today, which is examining the policy context of, uh, of long-term care and the ways in which uh, the policies support or do not support act as barriers to improving quality of life for residents. And that's led by myself, as well as Dee Taylor and Heather Cook, who will be um, speaking to you next. I'm going to hand it over to Dee. Good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you are calling from in, in um, the country. Uh, so I'm Dee Taylor and I'm going to talk to you about what what we did in the policy stream just as Janice has just described. So to, to start, um, this slide gives you a sense of the method that we use. And just to, rem to let folks know, what we looked at in terms of a research question for this stream, for the policy context dream was in a highly regulated long-term care environment, how do policies support or inhibit practices centered around resident quality of life? We looked at policies from four provinces, BC, Alberta, Ontario, and Nova Scotia. And we grounded our analysis and our method in the quality of life domains uh, written by Kane, and you can see them there um, listed down. We focused in um, really to ground our analysis in four lenses, and that was family, resident, staff, and volunteer. The other thing that we did within this, this uh, method is looked at what was written. So there's a lot of conversation about, you know, what is written and what actually happens. We really wanted to focus on, so what does the text say? And in our current analysis that I'm going to discuss today, we looked at uh, must-do legislation that was either long-term care specific policy or non-long-term care specific policy with uh, inclusion and exclusion of policy documents. And we really wanted to stay focused on um, residents living in facility care. So that, that took out any of the admission types of um, policy documents. And we ended up, once we looked at all of that uh, policy documents and the inclusion and exclusion criteria, 
We round out up with 100 level one and level two, and which is included in this analysis, 41 documents in level uh, one, so long-term care specific policy, and 59 in level two or non-long-term care specific policy. So next we're going to ask you to think about a question. Um, and really within this question, we wanted to know what you think about what aspects of quality of life should be in policy to enhance late life in long-term care. So as you go through, you can see there's autonomy, privacy, food, functional competence, um, and just wanted to let you know that functional competence in, in Kane's uh, definition is uh, relating to an older adult in long-term care who is, independent, is as independent as they wish in line with their physical and cognitive capacities. And that doesn't necessarily refer to the performance or the ability to form ADL. So I see we've got some really good folks answering questions. We're going to give it another minute and just see where everyone lies. Wow, everyone's really focusing. I see some really good commentary on autonomy and choice, on relationships, absolutely key. I see, see a lot of folks are agreeing there, as well as privacy and dignity. I'll just give you one, about another 30 seconds. Yeah, 80, so 83% are on autonomy choice. This is, this is really interesting and, and hoping, you know, as we get into the discussion section that you will um, have some good questions about, about these particular domains, I'm sure. Okay, so it looks like we're just finishing up. So the majority on autonomy and choice. Uh, then we've got uh, private, privacy and dignity, um, relationships which, which are key. This is all this is all excellent. Excellent. The poll is closed. So yes, we we moved into uh, yet yeah, really seeing autonomy and choice and uh, so we're going to have some conversation around um, how this is reflected later on within the results in, in policy, privacy and dignity, as well as we're seeing uh, relationships. Uh, safety, security, and order with 28%. So, you know, uh, that will play well into the conversations we have. Okay, so moving on into um, some discussions around the high-level cane domain findings. Just as just as we just did the poll, the findings in our analysis demonstrated that safety, security, and order was most coded in each of the provinces. And it was really around mitigating risk. Uh, spiritual well-being and dignity were some of the least commonly coded domains across all provinces, which doesn't mean that there isn't good policy on this. It just wasn't reflected as often as safety, security, and order or, or the other domains. There were differences in functional competence, and, and recall I gave that um, definition while we took the poll, but we think it, this may be due to the role of the physical environment. And one reason for the functional competence being uh, top range in Ontario and Nova Scotia, for example, may be due to their emphasis on the physical environment, such as the long-term care space and design policies. And Moving into what we found when we looked at the family lens, so that's looking at the policy again, just as a reminder, in that level one and two. Um, and what we wanted to uh, really think about was how families were reflected within these policies. And lately, provincial governments have been really more actively promoting how resident, a resident's family can be more extensively engaged and direct long-term care to promote participatory relationships that involve families as more active care partners. And if we think about that poll, relationships came up high. However, there is a language tension. Policies used procedural languages, such as who should do what, so conduct satisfaction surveys or operate a family council or provide information rather than really focusing on relationship building between resident, family, and long, the long-term care facilities. The other area we talked about within that lens is, or we, we saw within that lens, is facility design or physical design. 
There was a focus in Ontario and Nova Scotia in particular around this. It allowed for spaces for families and residents to interact and fosters relationships, functional competence, meaningful activity, and autonomy. In terms of family councils, all of the provinces mandate family councils be formed and operate. However, provinces differ on the depth of direction given, such as how to form family councils and how they should operate. For example, Alberta is very descriptive and detail oriented They have a whole policy on family councils. Whereas in Nova Scotia, it only has two sentences stating that family councils are to be formed and a family can request it if there's not already one in place. So a couple of questions for you to think about. What does it mean to have decreased dignity, privacy, and spiritual well-being in policy compared to safety, security, and order? And a second one just to think about is what role does food and enjoyment have at end of life? So that brings us next to our, to our next poll question. So in this poll, we'd like you to think about, does restricting families from visiting their loved ones in long-term care affect quality of life and the promising approaches described in policy? So this is an open question. So just type in your answers um, and respond in the chat box and, and, and later on we can, we can comment as we see, unless I see something right now and I'm happy to comment. Absolutely, look at these answers. Yes, families are an essential part of the care team. So promising approaches described in the policy may include having families as collaborative care partners, building relationships between staff and residents, expectations regarding communication between long-term care and families for updates. There's some excellent one. We're at about 39 um, responses. Family is the best advocate for their loved one. Right. And some of the policy texts that we, we talked about uh, supports this, but doesn't necessarily um, direct it. So we'll have some conversation about that likely later when we answer questions. Um, when we think about COVID, uh, for example, if, if families are providing a lot of care and help to staff, um, or staff are faced with a higher work demand, families also see themselves as having a monitoring role. So too few staff, too few resources, too little time, or are, as we are seeing increased deaths in long-term care due to COVID, how is the quality of life of residents and family affected when they can't be at their side at the end of life. So a lot of the comments that I'm seeing come up here really um, include that sentiment. So one here I see, during the pandemic, it is unfortunate that they are not able to be included. Absolutely. Excellent. So let's give this um, maybe 20 more seconds, and then we'll close this particular question, this particular poll. Absolutely, but family needs a broad definition. Yes, you know, that's an excellent point. I'm just seeing that. Um, and, you know, when, when we looked in the policy, there were different uh, ways family was represented. Sometimes they were um, represented more like staff, talking about um, the different sort of, if you're going to come in and volunteer or you're, or you're a family member, some of the processes for safety that you needed to follow. Um, and what is family, as this comment uh, suggests. And now we've posed the poll. Excellent. Good conversation. Thank you for your contribution. We're going to go to the next slide. And let's talk about staff, what we found for the staff lens when we looked at the policy. So just to let you know, the research question for the staff lens analysis was, does legislated long-term care policy direct staff to assist dependent residents with quality of life activities. So thinking about that quality of life uh, that you reflected on earlier in the poll, those domains of quality. So in our analysis, we revealed a focus on safety, security, and order, and medically defined relationships. So as you can see from the bar graph seven, the areas of Kane quality of life domains have limited consideration. In British Columbia, there was no staffing policy for individuality. 
spiritual well-being, and privacy. In Alberta, no staffing policy for autonomy, dignity, and functional competence. And within Ontario, the spiritual well-being, privacy, enjoyment, and dignity are represented with exceptionally low frequency, with similarly low frequency occurring for spiritual well-being, meaningful activity, and dignity in Nova Scotia. So some questions to consider. We're going to have another poll here. What does it mean to have decreased dignity, privacy, and spiritual well-being in policy compared to safety, security, and order? And what role does food enjoyment have at the end of life? So here's your poll. This is another open question one. Um, and just respond again in the chat box. Think about those questions. What are the workforce policy implications of COVID-19? What do you think some of those policy um, implications are? Workforce recruitment. Yes. So this, that, you know, it's, it's, I'm really glad whoever wrote that wrote that. Um, uh, yes, if you think about some of the implications around COVID, how are we going to recruit people into uh, long-term care? Um, that is definitely has been a worry before COVID and certainly is a, is a concern as we think about post-COVID and during COVID, uh, potentially of that second wave. Uh, only working at one facility. Yes, there's been some policy changes that we've seen in uh, in a few different provinces around working at single sites, need more funding, retention of team members. This is excellent. Um, recruitment, staff uh, wage gap between acute care and long-term care, some pay inequity issues. Um, yeah, really, really excellent retention. So. I'm going to go through uh, infection control measures and education, PPE. Um, have the personal uh, support workers stay with residents and not constantly rotate it? That has been a, a long debated um, question in terms of what, well, how do we think of a staff lens versus how we think of a, of, of a resident lens and bottom-up solutions, absolutely. Loss of quality of life, relationships, and connection. That's a really interesting um, point, and I'm really glad to see somebody write that in, because if you think about um, the context of long-term care, there's certainly more time for staff to develop relationships with residents, and so if you think about that as, as also a workforce policy implication, uh, within that quality of life lens, that's absolutely true. So let's just give this maybe another 30 seconds and then we'll close this poll and carry on. What else we have? Recognizing staff grief and bereavement needs. Yeah, really excellent um, comments uh, from everybody. Thank you. I'm just rolling through to see what else there is. Change of the staff to patient ra ratio. Um, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I'm just going through these. We can close the poll now. Thank you. Yeah, really good comments and, and hoping that we can have time at the end here uh, to have some good conversation about this. Okay. So just some high-level findings across jurisdictions and some of the key differences between the provinces are what I'd like to describe now. So in terms of British Columbia and Alberta, they have a resident right to live at risk policy. From, a, from the Brit BC perspective, it's written from more of a rights perspective. Resident rights um, tend to supersede what family wants. Uh, decisions override family preference and more neutral, more neutral in their language, written from a rights orientation compared to Alberta. Whereas in Alberta, that policy is written more from a legalistic perspective to reduce risk and limit liability. And they often use the term risk management agreement. Nova Scotia and Ontario focus on the physical environment um, when we're talking about this policy finding. It really does promote resident-centered care in the language, and functional competence is much higher in these provinces 
compared to BC and in Alberta. And just a reminder, when we talk about functional competence, again, using Kane's way of thinking around quality, it's residents who are as independent as they wish in line with their physical and cog cognitive capacities. It doesn't refer to performance uh, of the, or the ability to perform activities of daily living. So just a reminder there. In terms of end of life, in Ontario, dying is more proactive and assumes family involvement prior to death. In Alberta, family involvement is, uh, is really articulated with an end of life care. In British Columbia, very much a relational focus uh, where the role of families is recognized. And Nova Scotia, more retrospective family to be notified after death. Finally, uh, just a nod out to volunteer support. There's very little of men mention of volunteers in the provincial legislation. When they were mentioned, they were often described along staff or family. And the exception to this is in Ontario, where volunteers had a unique role and were supported. Uh, more frequent mention compared to the other provinces uh, often. So um, that is it for my section. I'm going to pass it on now. Uh, oh, sorry, we have one more, po one more poll for you. Um, should quality of life be in policy? And can you legislate quality of life? These are really um, important questions. Thinking about how we considered quality of, quality of life in this stream as paramount, how we looked at it um, in the language of the text. Now the question is, should it be? Should it be in legislation? Should quality of life be reflected in this policy language? Let's just take a poll or, and type in your answers. You've got two options here. Should quality of life be in policy? So you can type your answer in. And can you legislate quality of life? Take, your, take a poll. Yes. Should quality of life be in policy? Lots of yeses. Yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting um, to note, and, and of course, after this poll is closed, we'll have, I know Heather is going to talk about the implications of this. Um, interesting on the question, uh, can you legislate quality of life? Yes, it should be embedded in, at a legislative level. So most folks are saying, yes, you should legislate quality of life. Uh, the second one, of course, yes, it has to be present in policy in order to influence service, care, stand, and care standards. And there's a few folks that say uh, know the role of policy is to mitigate risk. Very interesting. Different definitions of quality of life may be problematic to legislate. Now, that is <laughs> what we found as well. How do you define it? To whom? From what perspective? Um, this is a very complex question. How do you regulate it? How do you know, um, if you're going to regulate it, how do you know uh, what bar to set and how? Uh, certainly I know there's, there's uh, research going on around this. There has been lots of discussion around it. Um, so, but how do you do that? Very, very complicated. Looks like the poll is saying, yes, it has to be present in policy in order to influence ser service and care. So people are thinking, yes, we must legislate quality of life uh, and underpin it with this concept that it needs to be influencing service care and standards. Uh, yes, policy is the main driver of what, what management and staff do in, lo in long-term care. Like Maslow's hierarchy, there are five factors of self-actualization, what could be in the basis of quality of life discussion. Absolutely. So, we, you know, this idea of Maslow's hierarchy is something that our stream has discussed uh, several times. So you think about safety, security, and order as a basis. Um, but then it goes back to another one person's comment. How, how, do we, how do we know safety, security, and order is what an individual may want? Perhaps they'd want a choice to live at risk, and that is their quality. How, how do you balance the two? Uh, and how do we actually consider this within policy? So really, really excellent points. Thank you.
All right, well maybe we'll leave it another 10 seconds and then we'll close this and uh, return to the slides. Yes, it should be in policy. It is difficult to measure, but certain measures should be embedded in policy, absolutely. And, and what we want to understand is, is which ones and how. Lots of discussion around this. This is excellent. It looks like we have a winner from the uh, can you legislate quality of life, and most folks are saying yes, must be present um, in policy versus uh, several folks still saying that it should be embedded at a legislative level. Wonderful. Okay. And I'm passing it off to my um, wonderful colleague, Heather. Thank you very much, everyone. And I've been reading the chat box throughout all of the questions, and I'm really delighted. their comments. Uh, when we started off on this project, there was sort of little belief that there'd be too much that was exciting in looking at policy um, in uh, Canada. And certainly, uh, we found um, interesting aspects that, that perhaps have really truly been highlighted um, with the issues of COVID-19 um, across our country. And certainly, um, even looking at internationally what's occurred in this sector um, with COVID-19. So while there are differences in policies and legislation in the long-term care home sector in Canada, there's also a number of commonalities. And one of the commonalities is the intention of the policies and policy makers. And, and we believe that it's actually to do good or make it possible for good to be done. There is not intent for some of the repercussions of policy to be negative in the sector. But some of the things that I think we need to consider is how do we know that the goal of good is achieved? So what's measurable? And I saw some comments in the chat box about the measurability of quality of life and, and what are the um, key aspects that we should be looking at. And good for who or whom, excuse my language there. <laughs> is, it, is it what's best for staff? Is it what's best for the government? what's best for seniors, taxpayers, or families, because each of those lenses will lead us to a different um, response. Policy can be a powerful and effective tool to drive change in a system, but identifying the potential unintended consequences of policy on those the policy is intended to serve is an important factor as we're considering the development and implementation of policy. The experiences provincially, nationally, and internationally with the impact of COVID-19 and long-term care has perhaps provided the perfect storm for um, the sector in focusing on policy for in focusing policy on quality of life measures versus uh, the safety and order measures that seem to be uh, paramount in most policy across Canada. Uh, we also need to look at the measures re that reflect the needs and wants of those that live in long-term care, and certainly in British Columbia. We're hearing a lot about the, the um, impact for families and residents who are not able to visit um, as a result of uh, policy direction intended, uh, we believe, to keep people safe um, in, in the um, long-term care sector. Sorry. So our, our analysis certainly found promising policies across Canada in many quality of life uh, domains. So our question really is, how, how might quality of life be lost in policy development um, as a result of COVID-19? Will there be impacts um, from COVID-19 that focus policy more on safety and security uh, than in looking at uh, the importance of quality of life in the sector? Um, it's it's uh, an important question that we think we need to continue to look at. Certainly, as uh, Dee has chatted about, the Alberta Resident and Family Council Act is a strong piece of policy that could be uh, embedded and adopted in other provinces. Um, the Ontario Long-Term Care Home Act has some strength on its focus on resident rights. And in British Columbia, the language around end-of-life care and a palliative approach to care and the importance of relationship in long-term care is one of the aspects that might be well translated across Canada. 
Ontario and Nova Scotia Space and Design Act uh, in the build and design of long-term care homes is an important aspect as, as well. So one of the questions we need to be considering as knowledge users, policy developers, uh, uh, and people who implement policy is once promising policies are identified, how do we ensure that the sector embraces the policy and we can monitor the uh, implementation of those policies to ensure that they're translated into a system into the system in a way that supports quality of life? And how do we shift the lens in policy development to ensure that there's a balance between quality of life and quality of care? Uh, we don't believe you can have one uh, without impacting the other. Um, and it, I also, we also believe that it's important to be able to uh, ensure that policy impacts can be measured and reported to the public in a way that's transparent and allows us to compare between provinces. Because our systems differ between provinces, it can be quite difficult for us to compare the sectors across Canada. The populations don't differ dramatically, but um, how we enact long-term care policy in the provinces do. So we have another question. It's an open question here. Uh, what does the future of long-term care policy ho hold post-COVID-19? Are we going to see greater or fewer policies? Will there be increased safety and security and order policies, or will other quality of life domains be at the forefront? And how will health human resources or the staff policies be impacted? And so you will uh, have an opportunity to type in your response. Um, and you'll see that we've got some polling um, opportunities as well. So I'll give you uh, a little bit of time to put some answer in there. So very strongly, um, there's a, a belief that the issues of safety, security, and order uh, will be foremost uh, in policy as policy comes forward. And there's some degree of uncertainty about what the impacts of COVID-19 will be on policy. And of course, it's very early days to consider that. Um, I think it is an opportunity, though, to, to begin the conversation about the quality of life in policy development. Certainly, uh, an expectation in uh, infection control type policies. Um, and I, I agree, there's likely to be more attention to families visiting uh, and the role that family pay, plays an important family role um, in supporting the, both the quality of life and the quality of care and long-term care. Um, I think it will be important to consider um, how the family caregiver fits within the system as more than a visitor, but in fact an integral part of the team. I think that, um, and really interesting to see um, the comments about health human resource, uh, more full-time jobs, increased funding required in the sector, uh, a need for a full review for the, from the type of staff to how they're compensated. And I think uh, certainly as researchers, we've talked about that this work has traditionally been women's work. And how does that impact the way in which our system, our long-term care systems function and the value that we place on the work that's done in the sector? The security of important uh, of uh, the the work is important, and highlighting the value that these uh, trained staff play in our long-term care sector, and looking at what does the training need to be, enhancing the professional presence and prof professional practice in the sector. The issue of benefits, of course, is is key as well, um, as is the need to look at what is the compensation. Uh, the need for RNs uh, and other uh, professional members as part of the teams more uh, increased is important as well. Um, the required training and refreshed training periodically, I hope, will come forward as uh, an important aspect to be considered. And I think there's a great comment here about the blend and enhanced prote uh, protective measures uh, for PPE protocols, et cetera, et cetera with some of the other policy work that needs to happen in the long-term care sector, how visitors uh, can impact the quality of life, quality of care, and support, <coughs> excuse me, support families and residents. Okay, we'll just give you one moment more. Certainly the 
uh, public pressure and attention is going to influence, I think, a long-term care staffing and policy. Um, and the, the important aspect, I think, is getting the, the conversation going about quality of life and making sure that lens is part of the uh, conversation. So I think we'll give you 10 seconds. That poll is closed. Thank you very much for those great comments. And uh, we'll be looking at those as we continue with our research projects. So thank you for that. COVID-19 has certainly shone a light on the long-term care sector, and it's highlighted several things, not just the shortcomings. It's also highlighted the committed, caring, hardworking staff and the passionate families who are there to uh, support their family members. So while in media we tend to see the grim stories, uh, when we look a bit deeper, we can also see the heartwarming stories about staff and families that have continued to provide um, support in the sector. Certainly there are um, safety and sec uh, security order predominate policy currently. At post-pandemic, we expect that there will be some increase in that. Our hope is that there will be an opportunity to balance so that there's some um, additional uh, policy support around quality of life and quality of end-of-life care, looking at potentially um, uh, opportunities for palliative approaches in the long-term care sector as a more prominent uh, support to the care that's provided. Um, looking at the issue of the physical environment, uh, very aged buildings um, often don't have sufficient hand-washing stations. Four bed wards are not conducive in outbreaks. Um, they're not conducive for the health of the four individuals, and neither for the staff. makes it much more difficult to look at opportunities for staff to visit, for example. Um, and looking at family engagement, family councils are one way that um, policies can support family engagement. The other uh, pieces will likely be some focus on family visitors and uh, volunteers to continue to support um, a very strained system uh, in COVID-19 or other such outbreaks. Um, so both federally, provincially, and territorially, uh, governments do need to consider the promising practices that exist currently and build on these all the way across Canada. Um, the resident right to live at risk, while it is mentioned in BC and Alberta's um, policy, there's, I think, more work to be done in that sector as well. I want to thank everyone uh, for joining us on this uh, conversation today. I very much appreciate it. And I think I'll turn it back to uh, Janice and the team. Thank you. Hi, am I all here? Um, so I think we're just moving ahead mm -hmm. to the questions and comments section. So thank you, Heather, and, um, and to all of our speakers. Uh, and of course, now we'd like to open up the conversation to all of you. Uh, so again, please type in any questions or comments that you might have into the chat box. I can see quite a few coming in already. Um, so I guess we'll go ahead and start answering some of those first questions that came into the chat box. And Janice, I believe the first one might be more so for you. Uh, so it, the, the first comment was asking for a bit more clarification around how the four provinces were selected for your research. Okay, can you hear me okay? Yes, that's great. Okay, great. Um, they were selected based on uh, the um, co-investigators that we were working with. They're all investigators in each of those provinces. And so we knew that we were unable to cover all 10 provinces. We wanted to have some representation, uh, particularly in Ontario. Um, and knowing the system in Nova Scotia was another added amount. They are all uh, unique in how they deliver care, but there's absolutely other uh, ways, other provinces that may be looking at uh, long-term care policies uh, unique as well. Great, thank you. Um, we also had a follow-up question regarding slide 16, which I believe was uh, directed at you, uh, Dee, so I'm just going to flip back to that. And the question was, um, during the slide, did you mention that BC's view is that the right to live at risk is based on the family's wishes? So I think this person is just looking for a bit of clarification. 
Yes. So when you look again at the policy text that we reviewed, family, that was from a family lens uh, that I was discussing that. Um, and so the residents' right to live at risk in British Columbia really is centered obviously on residents, residents' wishes, um, with the linkage to residents wanting, uh, where residents want families involved. Uh, so, so BC also has um, interlinked with that re residents' right to live, uh, live at risk, uh, the Family Council's uh, expectation. So the comment was meant to tie those two together. Great. Thank you for that comment. And uh, I believe the next question uh, actually was more of a statement. And so essentially it was regarding a poll outcome. Uh, so we received a comment saying autonomy has been noted as number one, which conflicts with what emerged as number one, as a number one issue during COVID-19, which was patient safety. Did any of you want to comment on this statement? Um, so it's D, I can maybe uh, start and then ask Janice and Heather to weigh, to weigh in. Absolutely. Um, autonomy was in, in conflict with safety, security, and order um, in terms of the COVID response. Um, <clears throat> but I think essentially our comment is, again, it, independence does, does, I guess I'll reflect this back with a question, does in, independence or autonomy, that sense of autonomy, uh, should that be secondary to safety uh, from, a, from an end-of-life, quality-of-life perspective? So it's, not a, it's a great, insightful question. Um, it's, it's a difficult one to answer when we consider quality of, of life. It's much easier to think about safety, security, and risk just at carte blanche when you're considering all those involved. But when we think about this being a, a resident's uh, last journey in their life, you know, what does that mean in terms of a, a conflict? Is, is autonomy more important to them than, than safety, security, and order? So I'll pause there and maybe ask either Janice or, or Heather to weigh in uh, on that as well. Yeah, I, it's Janice here. Um, I guess the other caveat to that, uh, Dee, and I think we're well aware of this as well, is that when you're in the middle of a, a pandemic, of course we have to take secure measures to, to stop the spread um, both within long-term care facilities as well as in the community. And I, I don't think we're suggesting that um, having safety, um, trying to stop the spread of a virus such as this is not critically important, um, but we have to think about it um, in the future as we think about the autonomy of the resident, as we think about their own relationships with family, how how can we build a system where some of that um, factors that give them um, some sense of uh, quality of life don't get thrown out with all of the safety and security? Um, so I, I guess making sure that we have a little bit of a balance, knowing that during certain times like a pandemic, it may rise to one more than the other but we can't lose what the residents themselves are really looking for as long as we're not putting others at risk. Thank you for well that, said, Just moving ahead to our, our follow-up question, um, what are their plans, what are the plans of this research team to ensure that their findings in quality of life are considered by government and long-term care homes as they review and revise long-term care policy. Uh, so I might uh, pass this over to Heather, given that you were kind of touching on that earlier. Uh, so uh, certainly we have um, done a few presentations of this policy, and our intent is to link through to government policy and decision makers to share what our learnings are and to share the, the importance of considering that quality of life. Um, aspect. Janice, I don't know if you want to add anything about any specific plans that we have. Well, I think that we've we've been advocating, especially uh, the academics on the team, um, for changes, for recognition of quality of life, for better um, attention to the staffing, particularly the frontline staff. So um, we've been doing a number of op-eds um, in this whole area. I think we have about 10 or 12 from our full team 
um, that have been addressing these and be happy to share them with individuals um, or point you to our website. Um, we've also participated in some of the task forces that have been put in place, like the Royal Society of Canada and uh, the Ministry of Health, the federal government. Um, we've also, um, one of our colleagues, our co-director, Carol S. Brooks, will be presenting at the Senate Committee uh, tomorrow. Um, so we're really, we are trying, but I, I would also take a shout out to anyone who's listening. If you know a way for us to get uh, this information on the agenda, we certainly have shared it already with our provincial partners in each of the provinces and made sure they were aware of what we were finding. Um, but we also know that those are one or two people within a whole bureaucracy. So if there are other opportunities, we would welcome that for sure. Great, thank you. Our next uh, question is also in part a comment. So uh, will there be any discussion today of for-profit versus non-for-profit long-term care homes? Non-profit and municipal and for-profit long-term care homes receive the same per diem for profits have to carve out a profit from that money where the nonprofits don't. Thus, nonprofits will apply the money inadequate though the amount is 100% delivered to care. So again, the question is, will there be any discussion today of for profit versus not for profit long term care homes? And I'm wondering perhaps if Janice, you might be willing to comment on this. Yeah, we, we don't, uh, what we had examined, and, and, and this is a really good question, um, potentially for a future research, we looked at public policy. So we looked at provincial policies that all nursing homes are directed, regulated by. So whether they're for profit or not for profit, they all have to hear, adhere to the licensing guidelines, the policies that are put in place by their the provincial government. So that's where we're looking at today. Um, we do have other um, researchers that have actually, in mapping care relationships, they looked at, they went to different facilities. They're not uh, as, you know, they're much more in-depth in terms of looking at the actual on the frontline experience, if you will, as opposed to the, um, to the uh, po you know, the policy that governs them. So we, um, today we won't be talking about that because the policies that we're talking about here are in fact, um, they regulate both types of ownership or all types of ownership. Um, and I think there is um, lots of opportunity to do more research into uh, policies at a more of a uh, organizational level that sees the way in which different um, places may take those regulations from government and create their own uh, organizational policies. That could be something of interest for sure. Thank you, Janice. Um, I'll let uh, Dee probably answer this next one. The following question is, what measures do sector stakeholders need to pursue to ensure that the never again mantra sustains itself through the grind of governmental policy development? as competing priorities again reemerge to threaten true transformational change? Wow, so that is a question. Um, you know what, I'm actually going to ask Heather um, to respond <laughs> I'm, I'm, to that one. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to help with that. So there are some, some measures I think that can support um, government policymakers uh, in making decision, and a part of that is uh, really ensuring that you have seniors with their own voice in the province. So, for for example, uh, you may have noticed in your chat box uh, Jim Mann's name. Jim Mann um, is, is a person with Alzheimer's disease. He's part of our um, research body uh, as uh, a person living with uh, dementia. Jim Mann gets his voice out in this province uh, loudly enough that the provincial government knows who Jim Mann is um, and uh, often seek out opinion from uh, people like Jim Mann about the impacts of policy and in the development of policy. So I think that's one important aspect that sector stakeholders need to do is to include 
uh, in your stakeholder group, people living with dementia, people in, living in long-term care, and Jana spoke briefly about the team that we have in SALTI that does include individuals who live in long-term care uh, and can speak about the big difference between planning in the long-term care sector or planning in government, working in long-term care, and actually living in long-term care. So there's a really important aspect about having the voice of the, the lived experience at the table. The other piece is really um, to, to know where there are leading practice and be able to bring that forward. Uh, I think it's always important when you're uh, trying to make a shift in a system uh, to be able to identify where there's a good place to start and go forward from there. So I'll leave it at that. Mm. That's great, Heather. I think that's excellent. And the other thing I just add on to that is, um, you know, in, in addition to Jim um, and also Faye Forbes, uh, also another person living with a uh, diagnosis, uh, we, do ha we did have residents uh, involved in our advisory group as well as uh, personal care workers. And so we, we were able to, and volunteers uh, and family caregivers. So it was really important, I think, that we hear their voices and they um, help to influence us and to ask, ask really tough questions sometimes around the research. Um, we regularly report it to them. So it was very helpful. Sorry, and I'm going to just add one last little bit just in hearing both Heather and Janice, and that is the, the method itself we used really was around quality of life. And so as we move ahead, either with existing policy or new policy development, Thinking about those domains um, helped us consider what is quality of life because it's such a big concept uh, to break it down and, and not just, just think quality of life in a general sense, but really start picking apart what does that mean and applying that lens. Thank you for all your comments. Um, in, just to keep in mind the time, I think we'll only have time for one more question. Uh, so I'll ask that one, and but please continue to ask your questions in the chat box. Uh, we'll uh, make sure to follow up on those questions and get you answers afterwards with the speakers. So last question that maybe I'll pass to uh, Janice is, should there be federal policy governing quality of life in long-term care, or should it remain a provincial jurisdiction? Oh, wow, that's a loaded question. Okay, how long do I have? <laughs> I think I think that's an excellent question. I, I do think that the provincial governments are probably the the folks that have the expertise in long term care and long term care policies. Do I think federal government has a role? Absolutely. I I do believe that they need to step up and um, provide some uh, real needed funding. I think this is one of our critical issues that we were we saw throughout the pandemic, but I, I do hope that the importance of long-term care and the attention to the uh, underfunding and the lack of recognition for this sector does not end when, the, when COVID-19 ends. And so I, I, I strongly urge us all to, um, to lobby our federal government to make sure that we, they have a role in ensuring ensuring quality of life, whether it's, uh, you know, a, a separate act, uh, a Canadian Long-Term Care Act, I'm not sure if that's the best way, or whether it's tied funding to improve long-term care. Uh, I think there'll be a lot of discussion about that. So thank you very much for that uh, eloquent answer, and I think that's an excellent uh, note to, to end on, because I don't want to rush you with asking another question. Uh, we do have several other questions that are still in the chat box, and we're sorry that we, we should have uh, added more time to the webinar, but uh, we will work with our presenters uh, to make sure that we get answers to all of the questions that were asked in the chat box today. And as, as you've noticed, they've grac graciously offered to share their contact information uh, on this slide here, so feel free to contact them. And we will uh, do uh, work with the presenters to get answers to all your questions, and we will also send you a summary of all the answers in the polling questions so that you have a record record of them as well, uh, so that you could have a record of the rich conversations uh, that happened today. So thank you very much uh, to uh, Janice, Deanne, and Heather for this excellent presentation on quality of life and long-term care. 
I think that we have definitely uh, gained the interest of our participants. Uh, so thank you very much for sharing your research findings uh, with us today. And we look forward to working with you to answer all the questions and get back to our participants. And uh, to finish up, we have a poll. I just asked you how, uh, how today's webinar uh, discussion went. So uh, please take a few seconds just to answer our webinar questions. So thank you very much, everybody, for this great conversation today. And we know that it will, it will not end uh, with today's presentation. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for participating. You may now disconnect.